So Bilahari and Philip will will chat for 20 minutes about the state of the world, um, which is an impossibly broad prompt. So I'll make it slightly easier on you by asking the first question. And the questions I want to ask you to Philip is, how do you think the world looks from Europe? What does Europe think is the state of the world? Bilahari, what does Asia think is the state of the world? Please enjoy. Now, based on what you just have seen, I would say that at least everything can be condensed to a fight between uh, United States and China, who's number one, or in the near future, number one, first, second. Everyone tries to find its way along this line, uh, its own positioning, uh, maybe take a side or found their own way. And answering your question, I would say that from all the different regions, they try to find its way, the slowest are the Europeans, unfortunately. Um, and I would say entire Europe, which includes in this case, well knowing that we are based in Switzerland here, includes Switzerland as well. And on this note, I think from all the European countries, Switzerland is at least the best and more agile country. So, but again, there is a, there's a wake up call needed for Europe, also in Asian topics. Well, to, to, um, to build on what you just said and what you said, Nico, I think all of us, whether in Asia or Europe, everywhere, are facing two fundamental realities. Right? First of all, there is a better understanding, I think, that you cannot avoid dealing with both the US and China simultaneously. At the same time, I know of no country that is without some concerns about both the US and China. Now, the concerns are not the same and maybe not held in the same intensity, but they exist. And that is the consequence of that is what we saw up on the slide, um, that the overwhelming number of people think this is the age of multi-alignment, or I call it uh, dynamic multipolarity. Um, it, it requires, to use your word, agility. Uh, Alertness and agility. Alertness and agility at a state level fundamentally depends on your domestic politics. Right? And unfortunately, in many countries, domestic politics is getting much more complicated, which can't be helped, erodes agility at least. <laughs> right? And prescribes many definitions of alertness. So at the very moment when we need these qualities, the, our politics, in different ways, I mean different countries, is eroding our ability to be agile and alert. I mean, so unlike the Cold War era, I think it was asked as well, thanks God not that many have voted for, but I think it's not that easy anymore because back then it was a fight between different systems, mainly political systems, Currently, I would say that is more a cultural discussion, right? And it's not only, you know, the good, the Democrats, and the others, you know, the socialists or communists or Leninists, but it's, it's way more complex. And so it's for the countries way more complex to find its way, to take positioning, to, to decide, friend or foe. I think that makes it way more difficult. Well, I think the fundamental problem is now, it's not possible to neatly classify countries into friend or foe, right? Even if you have deep concerns about uh, Chinese behavior, let's say, over the South China Sea or whatever, you have to deal with China, right? And to deal with China, you have to deal with the United States because otherwise everything will be totally unbalanced. But that doesn't mean that you, uh, that you are going to drink all the American Kool-Aid because you have concerns about America. I think this is an age of ambiguity, <laughs> of ambivalence, right? And again, I come back to this fundamental point. We have to be alert. I, I, unfortunately, I have to agree with you. I think of all the basic regions, uh, not excluding the Middle East, Europe has been the slowest to adapt to this. Right? Perhaps because you are the most developed, you have the most developed institutions. You need the institutions, but the institutions also slow things down. <laughs> Yeah, or they don't have realized what's going on in Asia, right? So well, think... they have vested interests yeah. in certain things and go on in accustomed paths. This is a very human quality. You know? 
I would say so. And would you agree that is more cultural debate? And where would you see the different? I have a bit of a difficulty with too much cultural debate. I think there are, of course, differences between cultures. It's, it, but you know, I think we should not make too much of it. I mean, just now I was talking to a gentleman from Munich, right? And we were talking about very briefly about cultural appropriation. I think that's one of the most stupid things on earth, right? Because what, what, what language are we talking here? It's neither of us languages, right? Should I not be wearing these clothes? <laughs> what am I supposed to be wearing? So culture, there is no traditional culture anywhere in the world anymore in its pure form, right? Uh, all cultures are amagrams of various influences, right? So yes, there is differences between Europe, Asia, different, different parts of Asia. India is not Japan. Japan is, uh, owes a lot to China, but it's not China, and so on. So I rather, instead of talking about culture, I prefer to talk about interests. <laughs> That's something that is capable of clearer definition. Yeah, I like this because uh, culture is, look at me, quite difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, having been a German, or I'm. German was now 10 years ago. Well, look at me, I'm half Chinese, that. half Indian. I but should be completely confused. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm know. not, I assure you. Outside Asian, inside German. So um, the question is then, if it's really so not a country part, but, but the question of, as you mentioned, um, it's a debate, it's a fight between uh, different interests. What would you say that some European countries, they say now we want to shift away from the interest-based foreign policy more to a value-based foreign policy? Well, there are no common values, you know. Or, or, we, or we, can, we can debate forever yeah. about what are those common values and how we define them. So I think that's not a very productive way to go. I think it's actually an avoidance. Yeah. Uh, you talk about values when you, when you are not quite sure what your interests are. And you or cannot, you're not quite sure you have the capability to pursue your interests. And you can quite often <laughs> not live up even to the values yeah, you just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. So it's pod, it will be recorded and somewhat published as well, right? So please, this is the main sentence, yeah. that it's stupid to shift from the interest-related foreign policy to a so-called value-based, which is not existing. Yeah. And honestly, interest, that's the reason why Europe has not defined yet its interest the real interest. What is our interest in Asia? What would we like to achieve? What is our interest from an economic point of view, political point of view? So, and this is still missing. Well, just to build on that, right? Europe is a bit, looking from it from Asia, right? Europe is a bit of an abstraction. No, we understand the EU and so on, as, in so far as anybody can. Yeah. Uh, but I don't understand the EU. Well, yeah. I know, but in so far as anybody can. Well, let's say Singapore. When we talk about Europe, we really mean four countries. In, uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, and UK. Because these are the four most economically important countries to us. And you will find, I think, if you go around uh, Asia in different, different combinations for different countries. Right? So, and similarly, as what Nico said, Asia, Asia is an abstraction. Uh, so, so I come back to the same point. When you talk in these broad terms, you get nowhere. I mean, it makes for very interesting discussions, but it doesn't uh, bring you anywhere to anything that prescribes anything practical for what you should do in situation A, B, or C. So as a Singaporean, so you would never say that you have recognized in the day-to-day -day business as a diplomat the European Union as a political body? No. No, we, of course we do. We have to say yeah. it, but we don't quite know what it means. Okay. <laughs> right? And you have to deal with it at one level, but you have to deal with it at multiple levels, right? I, I, I mean, I, I came to this um, understanding when we, I was still in the foreign ministry when we had concluded a free trade agreement with Europe. And then we started looking at how we're going to get it ratified. And I said, good God, this is the way we do it. All right. Lucky I don't have to do it myself personally. <laughs> Right. So, and you can, you can say the same thing about Asia. When, how, are you going to deal, how you deal with Singapore is not going to be how you deal with India or China or Japan or Indonesia or Vietnam. Or, or you can say the same thing, but the difference is Asia is not claiming that they are one entity, one body, whereas the European Union does, but cannot live up to this point and is not even realizing yeah. that it's not recognized as uh -huh. such. So I hope that many people will see this, the assessment from outside of the European Union and its actions or not actions. Well, 
we know that, but we are basically quite polite, so we pretend to believe it, but we act differently yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we interact with Europe. So, which means if oh. you would like to call Europe, then you call still Berlin, Paris. Well, then who else to call? You're not yeah. going to call Brussels. Um, or you, you, you will call Brussels after you call Berlin, Paris, <laughs> something, and then you tell Brussels, oh, all right? Yeah. Because they can, they can make life difficult for you, but I don't, in my own experience, not uh, always very helpful in making life easy for you, <laughs> even when the interests are common. Yeah. Okay, so that means that Europe cannot play, at least not playing yet, the role they have in mind on a global level, because it's state of the world? Yes and no. On the economic level, because Europe is such a big market, that I think there is a, a Europe, right? And you set rules and you have to, if you want to do things in Europe, you have to play by those rules, right? And you have to understand them. Politically, I think, you know, look, this is a world, whether you want to call it a jungle, like my friend Raja Mohan does, and I think that's a little bit of an overstatement, uh -huh. uh, or you want to call it a return to normalcy, which is what I think, you know, uh, you need hard power. Europe were trying to do it all with soft power because they didn't want to spend the money on the hard power, right? Now you can't do that anymore. I, I don't want to repeat what I said last night, but you can't do that anymore. So there are some hard choices ahead, right? Yeah, but exactly what you just mentioned, so I think the theory was that the United States will go back more and more from, from Europe, so we have to take our own responsibility. And currently they just try to realize it, that this will cost a lot of money when it comes to defense expenditure, for example, and they're still hesitant, but now they realize they lived in the last 70 years in a nice world, oh. everyone else was taking the responsibility and paying the money, yeah. and now they have to wake up, and um, this is quite tough. Well, it is tough, but there is no choice. Right? This, is, this is one difference between Asian countries, I think Europe, we did not believe that this, uh, we did not believe that the world was all that nice. <laughs> all right, so we kept the powder dry. <laughs> that's, that's smart at the end, so. I don't know whether it's smart or it was forced well, on us, you know. <laughs> after the 90s, I think everyone was, at least on a political level, was thinking that's now the, the decade, if not even the century of peace, freedom and understanding that there's no block anymore, no cold war anymore, and then we w woke up I think that's no only, only people in. I think that's only people in Europe or in America exactly. that thought that. Not even America, but in Europe. Yeah. You know, America, some you know. One of the most stupid things I ever heard any so-called statesman say is John Kerry, then Secretary of State, criticizing the Russian annexation of Crimea as 19th century behavior in the 21st century. Now there are, there are dozens of reasons to criticize the annexation of Crimea, right? But this was a stupid reason because it assumes. You say 19th century behavior and 21st century, it assumes your adversary shares your values, comes back to that point. Yeah. But if he shares your values, it won't be your adversary in the first place. And that's why you, it's not just Europe, it's also some parts of America. Right? Yeah. And even though after Crimea nothing has changed, honestly, on the Western yeah. side, even until last February, well, last February 22. Yeah, all right. Mr. Putin, you know, I was joking with somebody a few months ago, NATO headquarters should put up a small bus of Putin because he revitalized the, not just NATO, but the idea of the West. Yeah, make it <laughs> uh, even bigger with uh, Finland and, and, and Sweden and so on, right? Fingers crossed. So, but, but if we talk about the state of the world, everyone is talking about China, US, ASEAN, India is quite often mentioned. Not that much Russia, right? So even though there's a lot going on, does that mean that it's more an object of foreign policy and geopolitics rather than a real player? Oh, of course, it's a real player in Europe, but in most of Asia, with a certain exception of some parts of Northeast Asia, Russia, post-Soviet Russia, has not been a player. Soviet Russia or Soviet Union was a player because of the Soviet Pacific Fleet. There was very little political influence, there's very little economic influence, it's just marginal, these things, a bit on energy, a bit on weapons. But basically, because there was a Soviet Pacific fleet, you had to take the Soviet Union seriously. No Soviet Pacific fleet, no influence. When I became ambassador to Russia, this is the early 1990s, one of the first things I did is to go to Vladivostok and see for myself, just for my own personal satisfaction, the Soviet fleet rusting away. 
you know, they used to irritate us no end. You know, they used to fly their badges out of Kamran Bay, straight towards Singapore. Then you scramble your whole Air Force and they turn away. You know, so I just wanted to see for myself the thing rusting away. <laughs> yeah, even the nuclear submarines, which is... Oh, that was another yeah. issue, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, you know they, they, the Soviet Union's influence in Seoul was based on military force. That's yeah. too narrow. No military force, no influence for Russia. Okay. So then takeaway is that Russia plays maybe in Europe a role, a regional oh, role, yeah. but not on a global level. It is a regional power with yeah. occasional forays. And it has, a, it has a formal global role as one of the permanent members of the Security Council. Again, it can make trouble, but it's very hard to, to advance any positive agenda. Well, that it makes trouble that you know, we are all... Ex all aware too much. Yeah, all aware and experience it. Okay. Yeah. So it's like similar, you, you mentioned yesterday that something similar to Japan, that's also regional power in Asia, but not a on a global level yet. But Japan has no global if, uh, pretensions. I mean, business and all that, that's another matter, right? But strategically, it is, it is redefining itself to be the premier US regional partner and playing that role. <laughs> So in the 80s, Japan was a huge enemy also from the United States, and it culminated when they once bought the Rockefeller Center, Mitsubishi, I think, back then, yeah. in New York, and they said, this is the end of the world. Uh, but now, no one is talking about Japan. Would this happen also to China once? Well, one of the things that has happened to China over the last 10 years is that we now see, we have, I think, everybody a more balanced role of, uh, view of China. Uh, at the time, I'll say the Beijing Olympics. Huh? It's almost like China can do no wrong, you know. Now we know that China is a normal country. It has its strengths, it has weakness. And in my view, the weaknesses slightly outbalance the strengths, but it's not fatal weaknesses, which is like every country. It's like Singapore or US or Germany or, or Switzerland. Every country has strengths and weaknesses. It's a normal country. So that's interesting that you as an Asian say that China is a normal country. So yeah, of course it's a normal country, but here in Europe, I would say that's my thesis at least, it's very hostile towards China. It has in, become more severe in the last, in the recent years, I would say. So that whatever is something to do with China, it's seen oh, with some rejections, and we will see it later on when we have a business discussion. So everything what is going to China or coming from China is seen as sort of negative. This has changed, and it's not as open as it was beginning of this millennium. Well, I think it's an extreme version of what I was talking about. But I talk about a balanced view. You had a very naive view of China, and now you have gone to the other extreme. I think eventually you will come to a, something more balanced, but uh, not just yet. <laughs> Yeah. And China's not helping, by the way. <laughs> it's not helping, but it would be great. So yeah. if, if our colleagues, so I'm not anymore an active politician, yeah. would listen to this and would realize that, yeah, it would be good to come to first to own positioning, not only copying the United States positioning, that's yeah. first important, and second, at the end, to find out what is the good middle ground. In this well, context. before you can come to your own position and not just follow the U.S. position, you first of all have to be able to deal with the Russian without the US at your back. Because right now you're incapable of dealing with Russia without the US at your back, so you have no choice. I will remain <laughs> okay. incapable for many years, I would uh, say. So I, you are paying the price for that period of euphoria after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and now to invest will also need some decades uh. to match up what on the defense expenditure uh. even the United States has, has in Europe currently. Uh, right, so well. That's the state of the world. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's try to end sort of optimistic. Uh, I'm from Singapore. It's very hard for me. Yeah? <laughs> but we're in Switzerland, so we will find a way. So any optimistic note? Optimistic note is, as I, if you look at this in a cold-blooded way, we have been through this before. We have survived worse. <laughs> there is no a priori reason we cannot do it again. Not just survive, but prosper. We prospered before under worse conditions, yeah. right? And we can do it again. So we have one minute, uh, and the Swiss are very you know, strict on yeah. this. So uh, let me end then with a great philosopher, uh, Billy Joel, uh, okay. may known as a, as a musician, but he said once, we didn't start the fire. Yeah. Uh, it was always burning since the world is turning. So we have not uh, lighted, but we uh, can fight it. it. I think this is a, this is a good optimistic Thank note you. that, yeah, it's, it's a lot going on, globally, currently, 
but it's, it's not totally new, and at the end it will be manageable. Absolutely agree. <laughs> cool. Asia and Europe agree. Nothing more than that. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay, thank you. 26 <laughs> seconds. <laughs>